Some say you're the life of the party, baby. Hey, John O'Keefe, present, accounted for, out here. I got a sleeping cat. I got a beautiful breezy day. I got rainy coming in after an exercise experiment. I'm here reading. We have about 40 pages until the end of this book. That means two more days, today, tomorrow. That's what we're talking about right now. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, John O'Keefe present and accounted for. We are here to spend some time reading. We are here to spend some time understanding what happens after your main character decides to take a leap into the darkness of infinity following this experience. Welcome. Chapter 25. Okay, before we hit this page, you know darn well that we are very, very close to the end of this book. We are at the point where this story is going to be at its top point of the climax, right? Like this is the very, very, very thing. This is what everything has been leading to. So I know darn well I'm going to have to be ready to start reading out of the gate. I'm going to have to be ready to start giving that energy right out of the gate. We are reading one definitely long chapter, and then tomorrow we close it off. So I have no idea where this story is going. By this point in the uh, afternoon uh, or the book, we are getting ourselves just deeply embedded in this story. So I can't stop. I can't uh, wait. I'm so ecstatic for this moment to have happened in the story. So remember, as always, we always read the paragraph just prior to where we stopped so that we remember, oh yeah, that's right, that's where it is. Because throughout the book, we've got to have that understanding. We don't want to start today without remembering yesterday. We don't want to make sure, or we want to make sure that we've got that. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get this rolling. He had to leap. And by his death, the others would live. That was it. That was what Sandwich had been trying to say all along. And now he believed Sandwich. He put on a final burst of speed, just like the coach taught him in track. He gave everything he had. In the last few steps before the canyon, he felt a sharp pain in the back of his leg. And then the ground gave way under his feet. Gregor the Overlander leaped. Two questions I have right before we begin. What the heck was that pain in the back of his leg? That's something that I really don't have any understanding of. The other thing that I'm wondering a little bit is what is going to happen after we start chapter 25. Chapter 25, let's go. You know the rules. Chapter 25, Gregor soared out over the canyon, throwing his body as high into the air as he could get. He could feel warm blood running down his leg. One of the rats had gotten a claw into him just as he was taking off. There's my answer from question one. That is what was happening there. I'm falling, thought Gregor, just like when I came to the Underland. Only he was falling much faster now. There was no current supporting him from underneath, just the hideous void gaping below him. He had never really understood how he had landed safely in the first time. Never had a moment of quiet and clarity to ask Vicus. Never had a moment of quiet and clarity to ask Vicus. Now he guessed. He would never know. Maybe it was all part of the same dream and he would finally wake up in his own bed and he could go and find his mom and tell her all about it. But Gregor knew it wasn't a dream anymore. He was really falling. And when he hit the bottom, he would not wake up in bed. He knows that he has just sacrificed himself at the age of 12 for the good of an entire group of people who he has never, well, actually, he's only met for three days, right? He did this to protect his sister. He did this to protect everything and maybe did this to protect the fact that his father was alive and that he wanted him to continue because the prophecy states only four are going to die. Three have already died before. He is giving himself up for the good of everybody else. Something else was different from his first fall. By the sound of it, he had a lot more company. Gregor managed to twist himself around in the air. The light from his hard hat lit up an astonishing scene. The rats who had been chasing him, and it must have been about all of them, were falling after him in an avalanche of stone. The unstable ground at the edge of the canyon had given way, bringing the entire army down after him. With shock, Gregor saw a human was among the rats. Henry. Henry. He had been chasing Gregor too, but that couldn't be right. 
They both couldn't end up dead. The prophecy only called for one more quester to die. A flash of wing gave Gregor his answer. Of course, it was Ares, the bat, who was bonded to this traitor. Ares would save Henry, and the prophecy would be fulfilled. But the rest of the questers would be safe, too. Gregor had never seen Ares dive in earnest. He was heading for the ground at tremendous speed, dodging the rats that reached for him. Gregor began to doubt that he would be able to pull out of it. He overshot, thought Gregor, as the bat rocketed past Henry. He could hear Henry's desperate plea, Ares! At that moment, Gregor slammed into something. I'm dead, he thought. But he didn't feel dead because his nose hurt so bad and his mouth was full of fur. Then he had a sensation of rising and he knew he was on Ares' back. He looked down over the side of the bat's wing and saw the rats beginning to burst apart on the rocks below. Oh, Suzanne Collins, did you really just say that bodies, when they hit rocks, start bursting on the rocks below? That is powerful kind of writing. You don't usually get to get that kind of stuff in a kid's book. Oh, I'm sorry. This isn't really a kid's book. This is an adventurer's book. Sorry, kids. I didn't mean to put you down because guess what? When I start seeing rats exploding on rocks below me, I go, oh, but that's not for kids. Oh, they're not supposed to. Yeah, man. That's what happens to bodies when they hit rocks. Explode. Oh, man. The vivid picture that you just gave me right on Suzanne Collins. Just before. Oh, sorry. The sight of rats was unbearable, even if they had just been about to kill him. Just before Henry hit the ground, Gregor buried his face in Ares' fur and covered his ears. The next thing he knew, they were on the ground. Luxa had his father strapped on Aurora. Temp bolted into Ares behind him. A bloody ripred stood with three other rats that must have joined him in the final moments. He gave Gregor a bitter smile delightfully full of surprises what will you do ripred asked gregor run boy run like the river fly you high gregor the overlander said ripred as he took off down the road fly you high ripred fly you high shouted gregor as Ares and aurora sped over the rat's head they flew out over the canyon somewhere beneath them lay the bodies of king gorger his army of rats and henry the canyon ended and the bats headed into a large tunnel that twisted and turned every which way. Now that he was safe, Gregor began to feel the fear of falling into the black void. His whole body began to shake. He pressed his face deep into Ares' neck. Although it made his nose throb even more, he heard the bat whisper, I did not know, Overlander. I swear to you, I did not know. I believe you, Gregor whispered back. If Ares had known about Henry's plot, Henry would be flying somewhere right now, and Gregor would be? The last words of the prophecy came back to Gregor. The last who will die must decide where he stands. The fate of the eight is contained in his hands. So bid him take care. Bid him look where he leaps, as life may be death, and death life again reaps. So it was about Henry as well as Gregor. Henry had decided to stand with the rats. That had determined the fate of the other eight questers. He had not taken care where he leaped. He had not looked at all because he was so caught up in helping the rats. Henry had died because of that decision. Even to the last moments, he must have thought Ares would save him. But Ares had chosen to save Gregor. Overlander, we have troubles, whispered Ares interrupting his train of thought. Why? What's wrong? asked Gregor. Aurora and I, we do not know which direction leads back to Regalia, said Ares. You mean we're lost? said Gregor. I thought Luxa said you could get us home in the dark. Yes, we can fly in the dark. But we must know which way to fly, said Ares. This area is uncharted by flyers. What does Luxa think we should do? asked Gregor. There was a pause. Gregor assumed Ares was communicating with Aurora. Then Ares said, Luxa cannot speak. Luxa's probably in shock, thought Gregor. After what Henry did to her, to complicate matters, Aurora has a torn wing that must soon be mended if we are to continue, Ares added. Gregor suddenly realized that he was now in charge. Okay, 
Look for a safe place to land, all right? The twisting tunnel soon opened out over a large river. The source was a magnificent waterfall that poured out over a stone arch and fell a hundred feet to the river below. Above the arch was a natural stone ledge about 10 feet deep. Ares and Aurora coasted over to it and landed. Their riders slid onto the stone. Gregor hurried over to Luxa, hoping to figure out some kind of game plan, but one look at her told him that he was on his own. Her eyes were unfocused and she trembled like a leaf. Luxa, Luxa, he asked. As Aurora had reported, she couldn't say a word. Not sure what else to do, Gregor wrapped her in a blanket. He turned to Aurora next. Her left wing had a long rip that oozed blood. I can try to sew that up, said Gregor, not relishing the idea. He could sew a little, buttons and small tears. The idea of taking a needle to a delicate wing worried him very much. Tend to the others first, said Aurora. She fluttered over to Luxa and wrapped her good wing around the girl. Boots still slept on Temp's back, but her forehead seemed cooler. The medicine seemed to have quieted his dad down as well, but Gregor was still unnerved by how fragile his father looked. Clearly, the rats had half starved him. He wondered what else they had done. Ari sat hunched over in a position of such extreme sorrow that Gregor decided it was best to leave him alone. Henry's deception had nearly destroyed the bat. Could you imagine being let down by the person that you committed your life to? Could you imagine making the deepest promise anybody can make to anything and then realize that there was a twist in the person's personality that they decided to go against the goodness of the people and all of a sudden Aries is forced to make a decision. Who do I care for? Who do I go for? Who do I honor? And Aries decided Gregor. Does that mean they're going to be bonded from now on? Oh, I hope so. Anyway, <clears throat> no one seemed physically injured. Sorry, a Aries sat over, uh, hunched over in a position of such extreme sorrow that Gregor decided it was best to leave him alone. Henry's deception had clearly destroyed the bat. No one seemed physically injured by the encounter with King Gorger's army, except Aurora and himself. Gregor opened the first aid kit and fumbled around inside. If he was going to stitch up the bat, he'd better do it before he thought too much about it. He found a small pack of metal needles and chose one at random. Several spools of spinner's silk were in the kit as well. He started to ask Gox which kind he should use, but stopped himself when he recalled the blue blood pouring out over her lifeless orange body. He picked out a thread that looked thin, but strong. He cleaned off Aurora's wound as well as he could and applied an ointment she told him would numb the area. Then, with great trepidation, good word, trepidation, right? With great trepidation. He began to sew up the rip. He would have liked to move quickly, but it was slow. Careful work mending the wing. Aurora tried to sit motionless, but kept reacting to the pain involuntarily. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, he kept saying. No, I'm, I'm fine, she would reply, but he could tell it hurt. By the time he'd finished, he was dripping with sweat from concentrating so hard, but the wing was back in one piece. Try it out, he said to Aurora, as she gingerly stretched her wing. It's well sewn, Overlander, she said. It should hold to regalia. Gregor felt relieved and a little proud that he had managed it. Now you must address your own wounds, Aurora said. I cannot fly anyway until the numbness begins to leave my wings. Gregor washed off his leg and put on some ointment from a red clay pot he remembered Sol Solovit using for wounds. His nose was another matter. He wiped off the blood, but it was still swollen twice as its normal size. Must be broken, most certainly. But he didn't know what doctors did for a broken nose. Couldn't really put a cast on it. He left it alone, thinking he'd probably do more harm than good trying to fix it. Once he'd taken care of their injuries, Gregor had no clue what he should do next. He tried to assess the situation. They're, they were lost. They had enough food for maybe one more meal. Lux's torch had burned out, leaving only his hard hat for light. Boots was sick. His dad was innocent, incoherent. Luxa was in shock. Aurora was wounded, and Ares was in despair. That left he and Temp. Temp, said Gregor, what do you think we should do? 
where should we go? I know not, Overlander, said Temp. Hear you, the rats, hear you? When they fell, you mean, asked Gregor. Yeah, that was awful. No, hear you, the rats, hear you, repeated Temp. Now? Gregor felt a cold sickness filled his stomach. Where? He crawled out onto the ledge of the... Uh, the edge of the ledge on his stomach and peered over. Rats were gathering, hundreds of them. On the banks beside the river, several were sitting back on their haunches, their claws scraping at the chalky stone. The wall that flanked the waterfall, a couple tried to climb it and slid back to the ground. They began to escape, uh, scrape footholds into the rock. It would take time for them to scale the wall, but Gregor knew that they would be able to do it. They would find a way. Rats always find a way. He crawled back from the ledge and wrapped his arms tightly around his knees. What were the questers going to do? Well, they would have to fly. Aurora would just have to manage the rat if the rats climbed the wall. But fly where? The light in his hard hat couldn't last forever. Then he'd be in pitch black with a bunch of invalids. They had gone through this whole nightmare only to end up dying in the dead land between... Maybe Vicus would send help, but how would he know where we were? And who would they know? And who knew how things were going in Regalia anyway? Gregor and Henry had played out the last stanza of the Prophecy of Grey, but did that mean the humans had won the war? He had no idea. Gregor squeezed his eyes shut and pressed his palms into them. He had never felt so desolate in his whole life. He tried to console himself with the idea that the Prophecy of Grey had said that Eight of them would live. Well, Riprud would will probably manage, but if the seven of us sitting on this ledge are going to survive, we'll need a miracle, he said. And that's when the miracle happened. Bam! See what I'm saying? The beauty in a well-written story, especially when it comes to, say, a fantastic story, a legend story, a, a, an adventure story, a quest, is that you do hit these moments where you pause and you say there is nothing else in our power. And often, often, if you are in a true legend or an adventure book, a quest, something shows up. Something. Oh, you want me to read? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> and that's when the miracle happened. Gregor said a puzzled voice. He wasn't really sure he'd heard it. Gregor, is that you? Slowly, not willing to believe it, Gregor lifted his eyes towards the sound. His dad had weakly propped himself up onto one elbow. He, he was shaking from the exertion and his breath was shallow. But there was a look of recognition in his eyes. Dad, he said, Dad, what are you doing here, son? And it said his dad, and, and Gregor knew his mind was clear. He couldn't move. He should have run into his dad's arms, but he suddenly felt afraid of this stranger dressed in rat skins who was supposed to be his father. Was he really the same now? Or by the time Gregor crawled across the few feet of stone that separated them, would he again be mumbling about fish and abandoning Gregor into the darkness? Kiko, piped a little voice. Oh, Kiko, meow said Boots. Gregor turned and saw her struggling to free herself from the webbing that secured her to Temp's back. He hurried over to her and ripped away the webs. It was easier than dealing with his dad. Dink? Big fist? said Boots, and he pulled her free. Gregor smiled as if she wanted to eat. She must be feeling better. Cookie? she said hopefully. Okay, okay, he said. But look, look, look who's here. It's dad -ass said Gregor, pointing, pointing to his father. If they went together, maybe Gregor would have the courage to face his dad. Dad, dad, said Boots curiously. She looked at him and a big smile spread across her face. Dad, dad, she said. She wiggled out of Gregor's grasp and ran straight into his dad's arms, knocking him flat on his back. Margaret, said his dad, struggling to sit up. Are you Margaret? No, I have Boots, said the little girl, tugging at his beard. Well, Boots' courage might only count when she could count, but her ability to love counted all the time. Watching her, Gregor felt his distrust beginning to melt away. 
He had fought rats and spiders and his own worst fears to reunite with his father. What was he doing? Sitting here like he'd bought a ticket to see the event? Boots, huh? Said his dad. He broke into a very rusty laugh. The laughter swept through Gregor like waves of sunshine. It was him. It was really his father. Dad, Gregor half stumbled. He ran to his dad and threw his arms around him. Oh, Gregor, said his dad, with tears pouring down his face. How's my boy? How's my little guy? Gregor just laughed as he felt his own tears starting. What are you doing here? How'd you get to the Underland? His dad, suddenly sounding worried. Same way as you, I guess, said Gregor, finding his voice. Fell out of the laundry room with boots. Then we came looking for you, and you're here. He parted his dad's arm, or he patted his dad's arm to prove it was real. Here you are. Been away from somebody that you need so bad. You touch him, you touch him, and you're like, you're here, you're here. You're with me. You're real. It's no longer just a dream. It's no longer just a wish. You're here. Here. Where exactly is here? Asked his dad, peering around in the darkness. Gregor snapped back to reality. We're above a waterfall in the Deadland. A bunch of rats are trying to scale a wall. Lots of us are hurt and we're totally lost, he said. Then he regretted it. Maybe he shouldn't have told his dad how bad it really was. Maybe he couldn't handle it yet. But he saw in his dad's eyes sharp and sharpening in concentration. How far are the rats away from us right now? He asked. Gregor slid over to the edge and looked over. He was frightened to see the rats were halfway up the wall. Maybe 50 feet, he said. How about light? His dad asked. Only this, said Gregor, tapping his hat. And I don't think the batteries are going to last much longer. In fact, the light began to seem as if it was dimming as he spoke. We've got to get back to Regalia, he said. His father said, I know, but none of us knows where it is, said Gregor helplessly. It's in the north of the Underland, said his dad. Gregor nodded, but he didn't see what good that information did him. It wasn't as if they had a sunset or the North Star or moss growing on the north side of trees to guide them. They were in a big, giant black space. His dad's eyes landed on Aurora's wing. That bat, how did you sew her up? Yes, I know what he's talking about. A needle and thread, said Gregor, wondering if his dad's mind was beginning to wander again. Metal needle, asked his dad. Do you still have it? Yeah, right here, said Gregor, pulling out the pack of needles. His dad took the needle and pulled a small stone out of his pocket. He began to rub the stone along the needle in short, quick strokes. Get some kind of bowl. Dump out that medicine if you have to, said his dad, and fill it with water. Gregor quickly followed his instructions, still unsure, so what are we doing? This rock? It's a lodestone, magnetic iron ore. Uh, there was a pile of them back in my pit. I kept one in my pocket just in case, said his dad. Just in case what? Asked Gregor. Just in case I ever escaped. Uh, I had some pieces of metal back there too, but nothing the right size. This needle is perfect, his dad said. Perfect for what? Asked Gregor. If I rub the needle with the lodestone, I'll magnetize it. Basically, I'll turn it into a compass. If we can get it to float on water without breaking the surface tension, his dad said gently. Sli as at his dad said gently, at his dad gently slid the needle into the water. It floated. Then, to Gregor's amazement, the needle turned 45 degrees to the right and held steady. It's going to point north. That's what his dad said. It's pointing north? Just like a compass, asked Gregor in astonishment. Well, it's probably off a few degrees, but it's close enough, said his dad. Gregor grinned into the bowl of water. It was going to be okay. His dad was back. The sound of claws digging into stone wiped the grin off of his, off his face. Aurora, called Gregor, can, can you fly? I think I must, said, Greg, or said Aurora, clearly aware of the rats. Ares, if I point you toward Regalia now, can you stay on course, asked Gregor, giving a bat, the bat a little shake. I can stay well enough on course if I know the direction to fly, said Ares, rousing himself. Mount up, called Gregor, just as Vicus had when they started the quest. Mount up, we're going home. Somehow, everyone got loaded up. Gregor had temp ride with Luxa just to keep an eye on her. He slid boots onto his in, in the, to the backpack and helped his dad into Air, onto Ares. 
He checked the needle in the bowl one more time and pointed Aries in the right direction. That's north. That's the way to Regalia, he said. Gregor was about to retrieve the bowl when he saw the first rat claw catch the top of the ledge. He leaped onto Aries' back and the bats took off, leaving the bowl and a pack of cursing, angry rats behind. Ares followed the tunnel and headed north. And after about an hour, he called to Gregor. I know now where we fly. They flew straight for Regalia now, down wide open caverns. Everywhere there were victims of the war. Gregor saw bodies of rats, humans, roaches, spiders, bats, and other creatures he didn't even know lived in the Underland, like mice and butterflies. No, Ripred had mentioned butterflies, but Gregor thought that he had seen them in the Overland somehow. All the bodies looked the same, very, very, very still. It was almost a relief when the light on his hard hat finally gave out. He had seen enough carnage. In the darkness, he lost all track of time. Gregor could hear the horns signaling their approach long before they ever reached the city. He looked down vaguely and saw people waving their arms, shouting, neither he nor Luxa responded. Luxa was not even looking. For the moment they had taken from the moment they had taken off, she had wrapped her arms around Aurora's neck and closed her eyes to the world. Gregor couldn't imagine what she must be feeling. He had his dad back. Boots was safe. They would go back to the overland and his family would be together again. But Henry was Luxa's family, and he had given her over to the rats. What was there left for Luxa to feel now? The doors were flung open at the stadium and the city appeared below them. There was cheering and waving of flags. The palace came into view and Ares dove for the high hall. They coasted in and the exhausted bats simply landed on their bellies and slid along the floor until they stopped. Underlanders swarmed them. Somewhere in the confusion, he saw dulcet cradling boots and hurrying from the hall with their ever faithful tent behind them. A couple of people laid his dad on a stretcher and whisked him away. The bats could barely protest as they ca were carried away too, more in need of rest than medical attention. Gregor resisted all attempts to be loaded onto a stretcher, although he did accept a cold cloth for his nose. Someone needed to tell the story and he didn't think it could be Luxa at this moment. There she stood, pale and lost, not even noticing the whirlwind around her. Her beautiful violet eyes were vacant and her hands hung limply at her sides. He went to stand at her side, but he didn't touch her. He just let her know that he was close. Luxa, it's gonna be okay, he said. He knew the words sounded hollow. The room cleared out and he saw Vicus hurrying toward them. The old man stopped a few feet in front of them. Deep lines of concern cut into his face. Gregor knew that he had to say what had happened, but all that came out was, Henry was working with the rats, and he made some deal for the throne. Vicus looked at Luxa and opened his arms. She stood, still frozen, staring at him as if he were a complete stranger. Luxa, it's your grandpa, said Gregor. It seemed like the best and most important thing to say at that moment. It's your grandpa. Luxa blinked. A tiny tear formed at the corner of her eye. A battle took place on her face as she tried to stop the feelings beginning to rise inside her. The feelings won. And to Gregor's great relief, she ran into Vicus's arms and cried. <clears throat> Man. Have you ever been on an adventure? I don't care what the adventure was adventure to the store in which you thought you might never come back from. Maybe you were lost in the woods for a period of time. Maybe you had run away and thought that you were doing the right thing and then realized that you shouldn't have been there. Maybe a stranger had uh, made you feel uncomfortable. Maybe you were terrified at school when you were younger and you couldn't wait to get back in your family's arms. Maybe you've lost somebody in your life, somebody close to you, and you don't know if ever you're going to find comfort again. Sometimes we can feel lost inside. Sometimes we can feel lost physically. Sometimes we can feel lost um, within our own body. But have you ever experienced the relief of return? Have you ever experienced the relief of coming home somehow? That's where we're at. Luxa had hardened herself in a moment of absolute loss with her family, 
swore she would never be able to cry again, swore she would never be able to do that. And at this moment, feeling as lost as one could when family members go against the way it's supposed to be, and then to find your way into somebody's arms. Welcome home. You're safe. You're safe. As we <clears throat> leave chapter 25, which was an incredibly powerful and rip-roaring climax, right? There's still something left. There's still questions to be answered. What happens next? Where do we go from here? How can you possibly have another 20 some odd pages left in this book, right? So come back tomorrow, find out what happens in the next 20 pages because something has to. We call this the resolution of the book and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But we have arrived at home. Lots of people have died. Lots of animals have died in the war against the rats. Our heroes are home. But that doesn't mean we haven't gotten all the information yet. So come back tomorrow. Let's finish this book out strong. Let's get back and find out what's up. I love you. Thank you so much for being here today. Read like crazy. Find your own adventures. Write your own book if you need to. Draw your pictures, whatever it is. Live life. Because today is the only today that you've got. And I want you to make sure that you make it the best possible today possible. I love you. Thank you so much for reading like crazy with me. Now get out of here. Peace.